Well, welcome everybody to today's Bush Chat, where we'll be talking about the very first Tasmanian reserves that Bush Heritage ever owned. That's in the Liffey Valley in Northern Tasmania. My name's Matthew Taylor, and I'm joining you today from the Northern beaches of Sydney on the land of the Guy Mariegel people to whom I pay my respects. Now we've got two guests today. First, we're gonna be talking to Judy Henderson, who was involved right at the beginning in setting up Bush Heritage in the early 90s with Bob Brown. And then we're gonna to talk to Michael Bretz, who's managing the Liffey Valley Reserves today, who can tell us all about the wonderful wildlife that can be found there and his plans for the future of the Liffey Valley Reserves. We'll have time for some questions at the end. So please use the chat button, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen to enter any questions you may have for our speakers. And you can do that at any time. And just to let you know, we will be recording this webinar so that it's available if you can't stay for the whole time and also for people who haven't been able to join us today. So our first speaker, Judy, is a real stalwart of the environment movement. Judy grew up on a dairy farm near Bellingen in Northern New South Wales and went to school and later to university with Bob Brown a friendship that would later result in the birth of a new conservation organization in Northern Tasmania. Prior to this, her early career as a pediatrician saw her working with Aboriginal communities in Perth in WA, and then for 10 years in Nepal, where she trained village health workers in some very remote areas. In 1985, Judy returned to Australia and chose to live in Tasmania because she saw there quite a good community of wonderful people fighting for causes that were really important to her in the environment and social justice areas. So Judy, welcome. Thank you, Matthew. How are you doing up there in Bellingen? Getting a lot of that rain that you're very famous for up there? Yes, it's raining. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's raining out here at the moment. So I hope, uh, I hope you can hear me all right. No, coming across loud and clear. Well, I think the thing we're most intrigued to understand, Judy, is that, you know, 30 years ago, you were involved in quite a challenge of, you know, starting a new environmental organization from scratch. Perhaps you can share what your experience of that time was like, because I understand it was quite a roller coaster. Yes, it was. But firstly, um, Matthew, I just want to say that, as you said, I'm speaking to you from the Bellinger River in New South Wales, where I was born. And this is um, Gambangia country. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land and pay my respect to the elders past, present and emerging. I think I'll have to take a glass of water. I'm just got to. Yeah, no problems. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry about that. So when I returned to Australia from Nepal, um, I bought a house in Hobart where uh, Bob used to stay while he was in the Tasmanian Parliament. And at weekends, uh, I was often able to go uh, to his place at Ura Ura in the Liffey Valley. I especially liked visiting uh, Liffey when his father Jack was there. I'd known Jack practically all my life and he came, used to come down in summer to stay uh, from, from his home in Coffs Harbour and he would stay there over the summer. So old Jack was a real character and he had a great sense of humour and he stayed in an old shed at the back of the main college and I understand that shed is still there. During the weekend walks around Liffey, um, you know, I got to understand the environment more deeply and to appreciate the um, intrinsic value of the bush blocks that we were walking through. In 1990, we came to know that these blocks were to be put up for auction. And, you know, we were really afraid that the wood, chop wood chippers would get hold of them and clear fell the whole lot. And so really, you know, as we discussed it, the only thing to do was to find someone to buy them. Now, at that stage, I was um, chair of Community Aid Abroad, <clears throat> which later became Oxfam Australia. And um, I was visiting Oxford in the UK for a couple of weeks uh, when one evening Bob rang to say that the Liffey blocks were being auctioned that week and that he was going to bid for them. And I gulped and I sort of said, well, Bob, where's the money coming from? And he said, oh, I don't know, but we'll find it somehow. So a couple of days later, he called back and said that he'd bought the blocks. 
I said, how much did you pay for them, Bob? And he said, $248,000. $248,000. I remember flying back to Australia uh, a day or so later thinking, that's a lot of money and that's a lot of fundraising. So initially, Bob was able to put his Goldman prize of $48,000 as a deposit and he went to the bank to ask for a loan. Now, <clears throat> the first bank, bank manager was not at all keen, despite Bob's persistence, and he can be very persuasive, but the first bank manager, you know, was not keen. And a week or so later, he found out that that man, that poor man, uh, had been taken to hospital. So Bob fronted up to his replacement, who was new to Tasmania and had absolutely fallen in love with the beauty of the natural environment of, of the state. And he agreed to loan the money, bearing in mind that the only security was the value of the timber on the block. Now, the loan was later taken over by August Investments, and that was the forerunner of um, Australian Ethical Investment. And some years later, I ended up being the chair of AEI. And talking about Bush heritage, we realised that the um, AEI's lending rules would never have permitted a loan of that sort with no tangible security. Despite that, the the AEI directors were, were pleased that they had uh, taken the risk. But, you know, the loan had to be paid off. And so we had to get other people on board. So contacting friends and family and anyone could, who could help either with a loan or a donation to keep the operation afloat while we were developing the fundraising strategy. You know, uh, the other day I was just looking through my, uh, an entry in my diary from that time and I'd written down, I don't know whether we're going to be able to do this. It was very daunting. And, you know, everyone was so busy. Bob was in Parliament in the middle of the fractious Labor Green Accord. I was engrossed in a merger between Community Aid Abroad and uh, Freedom From Hunger campaign and everyone else was just as busy with their own project. But, you know, with the amazing support of those early donors, wonderful people who believed in the vision, as well as um, a huge amount of volunteer work in setting up the, you know, the legal tax deductibility and all that administrative structure of an organization. You know, we made it happen. There were so many people who were absolutely critical to those early days. You know, uh, too many to name here, but folk can see them all in Sarah Martin's great book on Bush heritage, which I really thoroughly recommend. Well, Judy, yes, that's quite a story from uh, those early days. And it's pretty amazing that all that work went into um, getting things going. I think you mentioned that it was a pretty close run thing in the first few years while you were doing the fundraising to pay off that loan for the Liffey properties. I'm intrigued. How did you go about communicating the urgency and the need to protect these wild places to potential supporters? Well, you know, our initial fundraising, well, the most of our initial fundraising was through an article which um, Bob wrote for the Australian Conservation Foundation's magazine, Habitat. The response to the article was amazing in support for, for the concept, you know, but we still had a big debt. We were operating out of a cubbyhole in the offices of the Tasmanian Conservation Trust, who were a great help, but we needed some good catchy banner headlines to, to get the attention of uh, people. I remember one of the first leaflets we produced said, suddenly the chainsaws are coming. It was very dramatic, but it had the effect of alerting people to the imminence of the destruction of the forests in Tasmania. Uh, another catch line we came up with was, we don't beat about the bush, we buy it. <laughs> we also looked uh, at uh, other organisations who would set up private nature reserves, including the, the US-based the Nature Conservancy, and it so happened that one of the conservancy people, Nat Williams, was visiting Australia at the time. And Bob and I met him in Sydney to get ideas um, 
which were very helpful. But I recall one of the most valuable pieces of advice he gave us at that time was the importance of not only buying land to protect it, but to manage it properly. And we must have funds put aside for management. There was also another thing happening uh, we've, we discovered that as well as attracting interest in the Liffey blocks, we started getting calls from people and letters from people all over Australia saying that a piece of their local bush was under threat and could we purchase it and save it? And that made us realise how big the need was for nationally for an organisation like Bush, bush Heritage. An organisation that was above politics and focused on protecting the unique wild spaces and their inhabitants across Australia. We initially called it the Australian Bush Heritage Fund. And we realised that to be a national organisation, we, we had to look beyond Tasmania. So even before the loan for the Bliffy Blocks was, played off, was paid off, one of our people, Margaret Atkinson, was visiting the Daintree and, and saw there that there was a block which was under threat. So we decided to purchase the, the, the Daintree block. And that was a, a step out in faith, but it established the Australian Bush Heritage Fund uh, as a national organisation. You know, looking back, I think that this is one of the most satisfying things that I've ever been involved with. Um, who would have imagined that, uh, that the fledgling organisation, which began with two bush blocks and an enormous debt, would develop into a major force in biodiversity and connectivity conservation in Australia that it is today? You know, Bush Heritage is an amazing story and I'm so proud of what you've all achieved. My involvement now uh, is with the Bequest program, which I think is hugely important for organisations like Bush Heritage. I have Bush Heritage in my will and I really encourage other people uh, to think about it. You know, there's no greater legacy that we can leave future generations than to secure land to protect and enhance our precious biodiversity, which is so much under threat. Thanks, Judy. That is truly um, wonderful to hear. What a great contribution and, and uh, to know that the organisation I work for today has... Um, grown so substantially from those that first few blocks in the Liffey to Daintree and now to having 36 different reserves all over Australia. And it was lovely to hear a bit about the creation story of Bush Heritage. Um, I think we got a lovely picture here of Judy and that's her talking to the horses um, from the very early days. That's Bob's cottage uh, during spring when you can see the wonderful carpet of um, daffodils laid out in the Liffey Valley. Now, if you're interested in that Bush Heritage story and what happened next after that first couple of uh, tumultuous years, we've posted the link to that book by Sarah Martin that Judy mentioned, in, and that's in the chat column. Where you, and it's a wonderful read and mentions a lot of the um, people who've been involved since the very early days. I'd also add, like to add a comment to Judy's last piece about just how wonderful it is um, the number of supporters who are considering making a lasting difference through their will because it actually gives the organization huge confidence when we're planning for the future and how we're going to meet the challenge of uh, bringing the bush back to good health with climate change and all land clearing and all the other challenges we do face so um thank you judy very much appreciated and as a reminder if you've got questions for judy um anything that came up there please type them into the chat at the bottom by clicking at the bottom and we'll attempt to answer them once we've heard from our next speaker. <clears throat> now Mike Bretz is our regional reserve manager for Tasmania and that includes looking after the Liffey Valley reserves. Mike joined Bush Heritage in May last year but he's already making a big impact. Welcome Michael. 
G'day, Matthew. Thank you for the warm welcome and hello to all the supporters out there. It looks like you've got another one of those wonderful pictures of the Liffey behind you there, or yeah. the mountains behind, yes. Yep, stunning spot. I like your one too. <laughs> Excellent. And what's the weather like for you down there? Yeah, it's pretty sunny today, but we're about to get some more cold and wet weather pretty soon, which is pretty much what we've had on and off for the last few months now. Yes, certainly been a wet year for most of Australia, hasn't it? Yeah. Well, listen, Mike, you've had a number of different careers, haven't you? But what was it brought you to conservation and bush heritage in particular? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to start by acknowledging the Tasmanian Aboriginal community, the Palawa people whose land I'm on. Um, but what brought me here, I guess, um, I grew up in Hobart. I um, was really lucky to, to grow up in Hobart in Tasmania. Um, and also lucky enough to travel extensively from a young age. And eventually, after leaving school, I landed in Western Australia and stayed there for around a decade, uh, working in a wide range of sectors from everything from construction to children's entertainment. Um, and I increasingly became aware of the environmental issues um, that were going on, particularly with climate change. And so I ended up studying conservation and wildlife biology in Western Australia and doing an honours project investigating ecosystem engineering by critical weight range digging mammals. Um, and over that period, I gradually realised that Tasmania was the only place I really wanted to live um, because of our amazing forest down here and our beautiful, cool climate. It's just such a magical spot. Um, and so I moved back here and I've, I've worked in fields of NRM, biology, ecology and community grassroots, environmental advocacy and campaigning uh, and have eventually ended up with the wonderful team at Bush Heritage. Well, do tell us what is it that's so special about the Liffey Reserves and perhaps you could walk us through where they are actually for people who may not be familiar with the northern part of Taz. Yeah, sure. Um, they are incredibly special. It's just an absolutely stunning landscape. Um, so it's part of the Great Western Tiers, also known as Kuparuna Niara um, by the local Aboriginal people. Uh, and this is an amazing escarpment that links the vast plain in the Midlands landscape and the central plateau. Um, and this is actually a meeting area between of three tribes, Aboriginal tribes, the Big River, the North and the North Midlands groups. Um, if you look up behind Matthew's slide there, you can see Taitutikapika or Dry's Bluff uh, that sits up just behind um, the cottage at Ora Ora. And there's this amazing sandstone band that runs halfway up uh, that mountain. You might just be able to make it out. And this sandstone band was formed 250 million years ago when Tasmania lay beneath the sea. Um, and this sandstone band contains caves and uh, overhangs, which were occupied by Aboriginal people for thousands of years. So it's an incredibly important cultural landscape. So where Liffey sits is about 25 minutes, half an hour southwest of Launceston. Uh, so nice and close. Um, but you're right on the edge of the Tasmanian Wilderness World Heritage Area. So we've got four reserves in the valley. Uh, the first one, Ora Ora, of course, um, Judy was mentioning, and uh, Bob Brown's former home is Liffey River Reserve, a little bit further up the valley. Coalmine Creek, which actually um, Bob Brown convinced Judy to purchase uh, many years ago and has later uh, passed that on to Bush Heritage ownership and management. And then the Dries Bluff or Teetitikathika uh, Reserve. So we've got those four beautiful reserves, two of which are now included in the wilderness, Tasmanian Wilderness World Heritage Area and the other two just border on that, on that boundary. Um, and we've got the beautiful Liffey River, Tilapanka River, that passes through um, these reserves. What also makes it really special um, are these forest communities. So we've got at Liffey River Reserve, this amazing wet rainforest gully that's a Gondwanic remnant with swamp gums, the eucalyptus regnans, the tallest flowering plants in the world, uh, tree ferns, myrtles, sassafras. It's just this absolute oasis. Um, and it's really important that we keep these systems 
in, intact because uh, we have lost a lot of these wet forests to clear fell logging and burning. Um, so having these old, wet, intact forests are really important natural fire breaks in the landscape. And there's been some really interesting research on that by Professor David Lindenmeyer and others um, showing that we must keep these areas intact. We've also got the wet Eucalyptus viminalis forest on a few of our reserves. And this is now a threatened vegetation community listed in Tasmania. Uh, some of you on the big island um, up on the mainland may refer to them as manor gums. Uh, we've lost about 78, um, or we've lost 95% of our 78,000 hectares of this forest type. So we've got some of it there at Aura Aura. Um, and in the 2016 floods, we got a mass recruitment of um, juvenile white gums popping up and they're doing really well. We've been doing a bit of revegetation on them as well. So it's great uh, having that, that forest type um, in the valley. Mike, you mentioned the revegetation there. Um, what, what are the key reserve management activities that um, you're focused on and that take up your time? Yeah, so our wonderful volunteers have been helping out with revegetation. Um, but a lot of what we do out there is weeds, weeds, weeds. Mm. Uh, so we get a number of species um, flowing down the river, in particular in flood. Foxgloves, um, uh, one of our number one weeds that we tackle. Uh, we are getting on top of it in other parts of the reserves. But, but yeah, when the floods come down, they bring seed from the forestry areas higher up in the catchment. Um, and that soil seed, seed life is around 80 years. So it really is a long-term um, management um, thing that we have to do. And in this past La Nina year that we've had has meant that they've been germinating all through summer, as have a lot of the other weeds, including thistles. So across our reserves, we've really spent a lot of time on weed management this past year gone. We also get a few gorse seeds coming down and then the dreaded blackberry, uh, we have plenty of those that pop up along the river edge. So that's a really labour intensive job because we don't spray herbicides around the waterways. So that requires cutting and painting effort. And I really rely on some fabulous volunteers to help out with that. So if you're keen, um, follow the links at the end of this and um, you could come out and give us a hand. Um, we've also got a, a really valuable neighbour uh, who owns the most beautiful Tasmanian native plant nursery. Um, and that couple, Sally and Herbert, are uh, very passionate about weed management. So together we're going to run a, a weed management workshop in the valley to really a real call to arms to try and get um, the local community fired up and tackling their little patch and maybe coming and helping out with us as well. The volunteers really make my life um, enjoyable out there and really help out with work. Um, there's lots of work to be done, maintaining the cottage. Um, so there's lots of painting jobs and general groundskeeping around the, the reserve. Um, it's really a, a an asset to have these volunteers come and help. Um, we've also got uh, one of the big threats in the valley is um, a lot of the, the roadkill um, that occurs all over Tasmania, but in the Liffey Valley, when I travel out there, I'll um, remove it off the road to prevent secondary roadkill, which is a big issue for our carnivores that come down to feed on that roadkill. Um, so I then take that back to the reserve um, often and I'll um, put it out in front of our fauna monitoring cameras, motion sensor cameras, and then we see um, some of those uh, Tasmanian devils and quolls, the carnivores, come down and feed on the carcasses. And you'll see after this webinar, we've got this fantastic uh, short video by David Gallen, an amazing nature photographer. Um, and that includes some of this footage uh, of carnivores and some other species um, in the valley. Um, we also got this um, Tasmanian betong recorded for the first time on one of our reserves um, in Liffey. Uh, these are another um, uh, little digging mammal, which are really stunning. Um, we've got this photo up now of the spotted tail quoll. These guys are <laughs> pretty cheeky. 
they come down and together with the Tasmanian Devil, they use the the Liffey footbridge at Aura Aura um, as a latrine. Uh, so we get all kinds of interesting scats and get to see what they've been eating. Uh, and sometimes we can get a little slippery. So uh, watch out if you come and visit. Uh, then we've got the bandicoots. Uh, these guys are my favourites um, because I did my honours project on them. So we've got the Eastern Bard bandicoot. You can see that slide there with those stylish stripes that they've got. And then the little Southern Brown bandicoot as well. And some of you, well, most of you are probably aware of the, the term ecosystem engineering, that a species can uh, impact its surrounding landscape by certain actions that it does. So these guys are capable of turning over three to four tonne of soil every year as they dig wow. for underground fungi. And that fungi, um, the, the mycelium roots on it, link in with fine root hairs of trees. Um, and that facilitates interaction between water and nutrients between the species. We're now starting to understand just a little bit about what's going on there with this concept of the wood wide web where yeah, species are interacting underground. Um, part of the, the work they do when they're digging the soil aeration, which helps with water infiltration. Um, it also breaks up the leaf litter, which is really important um, for um, soil health. And it's also found to influence fire intensity because you're speeding up that breakdown process, you're getting rid of fuel. Um, and it's just this really important process. And we're so lucky to have them in Tasmania, uh, a number of digging mammals that do this uh, because we don't have foxes. Um, so the Liffey Valley is really important for these kinds of species because they rely on these kind of farming areas or former farming areas that have grassland and that interface between these grassy woodlands and the bushland behind. So they really rely on that and we're really lucky to have them. We've also got long-nosed potteroos, another little digging mammal. Um, the platypus, the famous leafy platypus, you'll see some footage of that in the uh, video after the webinar as well. Um, and if you want to check out a little bit more on the Eastern Bard Bandicoot, uh, just a couple of nights ago on ABC News, they had a feature on you know, Northern Tasmanian uh, Eastern Bard Bandicoots. So check that out. Fantastic, Mike. Well, we're gonna, we'll post a link to that um, ABC News article because it's a wonderful little story that I had a look at myself last night. Let's move on to the future, Mike. What... Um, what, what does the future hold for Liffey? What, what are your plans? Lots of work. Apart from our general um, maintenance work that's ongoing out there that I've mentioned, uh, we also have um, the Aura Aura Community Engagement Plan, a big site plan that's basically the vision of uh, Bob Brown to, to really um, reinvigorate the site and encourage people to spend some more time out there. So um, many of you will be aware of the old sign that Bob had up there, that trespassers are welcome. Um, so that still stands uh, and Bob still spends plenty of time out there. So if you see smoke coming out of the chimney of the cottage, head on over and he'll make you a cup of tea. Um, but watch out if it's uh, just me, then I might just put you to work instead. <laughs> <laughs> um, but visit any time and you'll see some of the work that we're undertaking and we're undertaking that thanks to the really generous support from that first call out of the community engagement plan so um, we've just finished building a composting toilet block well almost finished uh, in the next next week we should have the final hand railing up so that'll mean that people can come out um, and use the facilities spend a little bit longer on the site and be a bit more uh, comfortable for groups as well. We're also um, improving the old barn and converting that into a day use shelter for those days when groups are out there and it's really wet and cold so they can shelter in there. Um, we've also finished a new walking track which will link up a new uh, car park further down the road um, and that'll really encourage people to move throughout the the property uh, and walk around and really take in that just stunning landscape that it's on. Um, yeah, lots of exciting things. And the next thing we're planning is a 
caretaker, volunteer caretaker residents. So the idea behind that is we're going to have um, permanent caretakers there to meet and greet visitors and hopefully help me out with some of this wonderful work. So we will be making a call out uh, for supporting um, the building of that building um, and keep an eye out for it. Well, thanks, Mike. That was great to hear about some of the what's happening in uh, in the Liffey Valley Reserves and also that amazing wildlife. I tell you what, us North Islanders uh, are very envious of the uh, native mammals you've still got on Tasmania. Yeah, and thanks for that so lovely fun. presentation. Um, it's the only one I think I've ever come across that finishes with a toilet. So congr <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> we can't let the fauna have all the fun. Excellent. Now, if you've got any questions, I've seen a few coming in already, which we'll get to in just a sec. Please put them in the chat. That's either for Judy, um, our first speaker, or for Mike, and we'll see if we can get to as many as possible in the next few minutes. Um, if we don't get to your question, we'll uh, today we'll come back and try and follow up with you afterwards, if provided we've got your contact details. A um, couple of things I wanted to mention. Uh, we have had a question already about volunteering. Um, I think both Anne and Rebecca have asked, you know, if I'm visiting Tassie, can we volunteer? And we certainly could not do all the amazing, fantastic work without the hundreds of volunteers we have across the country and the thousands of volunteer hours that we uh, are the beneficiaries of each year. We do have a fantastic volunteer program. So if you'd like to do that, please get in contact with us via the website and we'll put a link up in the chat and um, also a note that it's a bit cold in winter isn't it Mike so the volunteer program sort of kicks off in spring doesn't it? That's right we're having a bit of a winter recess at the moment and partly as well because we're in uh, constructing uh, the toilets but yeah um, it's pretty chilly out there at the moment so springtime we'll start again and run through summer. Wonderful and if you've been inspired by any of the projects or the work that uh, Mike's doing <clears throat> and would like to support any of those programs you're very welcome to do so and we'll post a chat uh, link for making donations to Bush Heritage. Okay, well now it's question time and um, I'm just going to have a look at some of the questions we've been asked. Um, I think you've, Judy and Mike have definitely persuaded everybody that Liffey is the place to visit and the question is how can we visit? Um, and Mike, do you want to let us know, because I think we've probably got the most open access of any of our reserves, haven't we, in the Liffey Valley? Yeah, I'd, I'd have to say uh, how you can visit is a little bit up to a, uh, the state premiers at the moment. But uh, <laughs> when you are, when the borders are completely open, um, yeah, so I'd, I'd recommend first go to our website and check out, um, the, just type in the Liffey Valley Reserves and you'll get a bit of a, a self-guided uh, explanation on how to um, how to access them, a little map on how to get from Launceston, um, and then what to bring, what to expect. Um, there's a good link in there about the Liffey River Reserve because we've got a three and a half kilometre walking track in there, which also forms a lot of the work we do and volunteer hours um, doing track maintenance. So check out the website. It's all pretty self-explanatory. Bring some warm weather. Um, and forget about your mobile phone because you won't have any phone reception out there. So enjoy that, a, a deep digital detox. Wonderful, wonderful. I can certainly uh, speak to how beautiful it is walking that, that uh, walk we have that meanders through the Liffey Valley. It's one of the first uh, visits I did to a Bush Heritage Reserve five years ago when I joined the organisation. Um, so yes, please do come and visit. Um, now we've had a question about the devil facial tumor disease um, and whether that's affecting the Tassie devils you get um, near you in the Liffey. Yeah, unfortunately it is. It's, it's, it has decimated the population in Tasmania. It's crashed by about 80%, but they are seeing some signs of recovery. So the, uh, the disease itself is adapting to the devil, but the devil's also adapting uh, to the disease as well. So it's evolution at work. Um, so we are seeing some individuals, there's recent research to suggest individuals are starting to recover from it and some of them are getting, uh, being born with immunity to the disease. So we have unfortunately seen um, some of those really sad cases on the cameras um, so they have highly advanced. Uh, last, over summer we had four individuals uh, being recorded on the cameras 
and only one of them uh, didn't have the disease. Um, but they are uh, population um, estimates are suggesting that that will continue to decline a little, but it's looking like it's stabilising thanks to um, the evolutionary processes of the devil uh, being able to get some sort of genetic resistance um, to the disease. Excellent. So there's hope for them. Definitely. Yep. Wonderful. Well, there's a question here for Judy, um, which is, what would you say is the most pressing environmental concern we're facing in Australia at the moment? Well, no doubt it's, it's climate change. Mm. You know, uh, we know the effect of climate change with the loss of our precious uh, biodiversity due to, due to loss of habitat. You know, and that's where organisations like Bush Heritage are so critical. We just must protect and restore habitat for all the birds and animals and all the other critters that are so much under threat. National parks are good, but also private reserves, you know, managed for the protection of biodiversity. And that's so important. Yes, indeed. Um, I think there was a, 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 another part to that um, question as well, which is, do you have a message particularly for young people? Because we've, um, they're inheriting the wonderful work that you and many others have done in setting up organisations like Bush Heritage, but there's a lot of work still to do. Well, there is a lot of work still to do. But, you know, it's so encouraging to see the younger generation uh, are taking on the whole fight against climate change and, and uh, environmental protection. You know, the younger generation are our future and uh, they're the great hope for the future. And I, the message is keep going, keep doing what you're doing because you're showing us oldies that that's the way of the future. So uh, it's just wonderful to see, you know, the lights of, of, of some of these climate activists and, and other um, environmentalists that are so much um, coming to the fourth in the younger people. Yes, indeed. And um, <clears throat> linked to that question, we've had a question just come in from Pam, which is uh, to do with climate change and how that affects existing vegetation. Um, and the question, and this may be something I can answer as well, which is, um, are we planting non-endemic native species so that the fauna has something to move into? Um, so I might answer that and Mike, please jump in as well. Um, yes, it's something that um, Bush Heritage is extremely aware of. And in fact, we've just done a replanning of our thinking for the next sort of seven years out to 2030 to look at how we can adapt to and accommodate um, the changes in environment. So using modelling with CSIRO, we've actually had a look and anticipated what might happen. And we started some pilot programmes, which uh, you can read about on the website, um, for to do climate ready reveg, we're calling it, where we've actually brought in the right species, the same species, but we've looked about where they're growing in hotter and drier climates and because we've had, for instance, dieback on our Ardu Hills Reserve, we've had dieback of some of the eucalypts because they were just totally overstressed during the hot summers we had two, three years ago. Um, and as a result, we don't want to lose that vegetation cover. So we've looked to find slightly different provenances of trees that are growing quite happily a bit further north and west that are used to that drier and warmer climate. And we've got... Uh, a massive program of planting on a very scientific format of grids and, and each tree is barcoded so that we know it's where it's from and what it's doing and when it was planted. And that's a 10 year at least project to see which of those trees will survive better. So we're very much um, uh, looking to how we need to adapt um, to look after the landscape. Um, so that's one of the answers. Mike, anything you wanna to add to that? Yeah, I think it's it's much a much greater scale um, that that project's dealing with compared to um, Aura Aura, which is the only property we've done any planting on, uh, because we have yeah wonderful intact reserves down here. We're quite lucky and privileged. Um, so yeah, fantastic project that's going on um, up on the Big Island. Yes, fantastic. 
Um, Mike, we've talked a lot about the wonderful mammals you get in the Liffey. There's a question here about what about the birds? And yeah, anything else that's wonderful there? Yeah, the birds are wonderful. Uh, in fact, um, they, not to be outdone by the mammals, um, we just last week we had a wedge-tailed eagle swoop in and uh, start feeding on one of those pieces of roadkill that we'd left out that the, the devils and quolls hadn't quite finished off. And, uh, yeah, it was amazing. But, um, yeah, we get uh, a number of owl species there. I hear them at night. It's really beautiful. Um, we get um, the black cockatoo, um, yellow-tailed black cockatoo, which Aura Aura is um, named after, um, swooping through the valley. Um, two or three species of cuckoo over summer. Um, they are just calling constantly. It's amazing. Um, and the pink robin up at the Liffey River Reserve in the, in the rainforest um, is a bit of a special one as well to see that. So if you're really quiet when you're walking along up there, when you come and visit, you might be lucky enough to see one. Well, I have to say I was lucky enough to see one when I visited that five years ago, and I'm looking forward to uh, revisiting again. And uh, just to reiterate, if, um, for those people who've asked the question and would like to consider it, please do come and visit the Liffey Valley Reserves. They are uh, utterly fantastic. Well, thanks, Mike, and thanks, Judy, for uh, talking to us today. I think that's given a wonderful insight into the value of um, having those wonderful, cool forests down in Tasmania and wonderful to hear the um, background story. So thanks for joining us today. Um, to finish off the webinar, I'm now going to uh, hand over to Miranda Bauman, um, who has helped organise this event today and who looks after our bequest supporters in our Gifts and Wills teams. Thanks, Miranda. Thank you, Matthew. Firstly, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm joining from, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. As we approach NIDOC week in a few days, events like this remind me of the importance of NIDOC 2021's theme of Hill Country. And I reflect that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples continue to lead the way on managing Australia's landscapes with over 60,000 years of experience for caring for country. I'd also like to thank our speakers, Judy Henderson, Michael Bretz, and host Matthew Taylor for sharing their stories and their work with us today. I'm left feeling totally inspired by the immense and remarkable journey to create British heritage and the work being done today to preserve the special region. Very importantly, I would like to thank each of you for your support, which makes the vital on the ground work uh, that Bush Heritage is doing all across Australia possible. As you may know, these Bush Chats are a Bush Legacy Circle event. So many of you online already have a legacy gift in your will or are considering bush, putting Bush Heritage in your will. Um, so thank you very much for that and for protecting our remaining species in this very far-sighted way. For those of you who are interested in learning more about this simple but significant way of supporting our work, please get in touch. The team and I pictured here, that's Alana, Sally and myself. Uh, we'd love to have a chat and give you some more information. We have shared the link to our Gifts and Wills webpage and our contact details in the chat, but also feel free to send us a message in the Zoom chat if you'd like us to get in touch. Uh, look, yeah, we've really enjoyed, um, you know, sharing this webinar with you. We hope you've enjoyed joining with us. So, uh, and if you did, please look out for the invitation to our next one, which will be from Carnarvon Reserve in October. We look forward to seeing you then. Uh, if you do have time, I welcome you to stick around and watch a few more minutes of this wonderful, uh, beautiful video of the wildlife at Liffey Valley and reflect on the importance of nature in your life. Thanks for joining us and bye for now.